Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what are my favorite theorems, as usually bias point of view, right? So um, today's topic are, well, various incarnation of the so-called Boschuk Ulam theorem. I should apologize right away, I will mispronounce a lot of names here. Uh, so Boschuk, for example, uh, was a Polish mathematician and well, it's a very, well, Boschuk means badger. And I probably, completely mispronounce it, but it hopefully doesn't matter so much. There will be other names which will also be mispronounced anyway. So I'm just not very good. Anyway, um, I would like to tell you something about uh, various incarnations of this theorem. So it's actually a very famous theorem. So if you just Google it, you will find very, very quite a few very good videos about it. I would like to take a slightly different perspective today, uh, not just focusing on the theorem, but actually what it, in my opinion, makes really impressive or really, really good. Um, well, it is really good, uh, just stated in a vacuum because it's, it's a fixed point theorem in some sense, and it's fixed point theorems are always good, but uh, what it makes so, what it makes it so so nice is actually that it has various flavors and basically opened together with uh, its cousin, the Bauer fixed point theorem, some kind of com topological combinatorics. So it has uh, a lot of different equivalent formulations, which we will some of which we will discuss today. And some of them are pretty surprising because they apparently have nothing to do with the well, maybe not nothing, but they are certainly discrete versions. They look like discrete versions of the original problem. They're really parts of combinatorics, not of topology, or maybe set theory, or not of topology. So, um, kind of, this is a subtitle: topology or something else. And I like to stress it again that that's kind of what makes the theorem so impressive. It's first of all very easy to state. That's probably why you have so many uh, YouTube videos about it. Uh, second, it's visually appealing. You you can make some nice visual effects. In particular, with some of the reformulations, you will see. And there is, well, we'll see some very classical, it is some kind of classical um, theorem that most mathematicians actually know. And it's, it's popular in, in, well, well, it's popular in popular science. Very good. Very good. Um, anyway, so as I said, my focus will be more on the various incarnations and why should I care about the various incarnations. So I stole this idea from a very nice book, which is literally called Using the Borshuk Ulam Theorem. So it's about the applications in combinatorics, topology, what, uh, topology of course, um, set theory, whatever. Um, and well, what, what surprised me a lot, links are in the description as usual for everything. And what surprised me a lot is that it actually also has application outside of mathematics. I mean, seriously outside of mathematics. I found a paper link in the description uh, about black holes and how the Borshuk Ulam theorem can be used to prove something about black holes. Okay. Um, if you see the theorem and try to find black holes, I have no idea where they appear. So it's, it's a bit mysterious. And so these are really the good breakthroughs, right? And another one also linked in the description about brain activity. So really something that is absolutely nothing to do with topology or mathematics or whatever. So I think this is really good. Um, so yeah, let's just jump right into it and start with the theorem itself. So um, the borshuk ulam theorem topologically. Very easy statement, it's down here. So every continuous map has a fixed point in that sense. So I have a map from Sn to Rn and some point is and its antipodal partner. So antipodal is just, let them draw a circle. This is n equals one case. Um, so antipodal, would mean, well, this is a really bad circle, but I hope you can, uh, you apologize my approximation. So antipodal would mean, well, one is here, uh, one is here. This is a really bad illustration. You get the point, two, two, two different poles, like a North Pole and the South Pole, right? And they are mapped to the same point in R. So here would be R, this would be S1, so R1 if you want, and they are mapped to the same point. And every continuous map has such a point. It's kind of a fixed point, right? And fixed point theorems are always useful. Um, the illustration I have here is slightly different. It's a two-dimensional one. So here, this is, should be a sphere. 
So this is actually a sphere. So it's S2. So here n equals two. And what you should think is you have a rubber ball in your hand. Well, maybe a rubber ball wouldn't do. You have a sphere built out of paper. You crumble your paper until it's flat. And flat means you are in R2. And there will be still some antipodal pair of antipodal points which are mapped to the same, to the same point. That's a pretty nice um, fixed point type theorem, a la, a la Banach type, Banach's fixed point theorem. And you can actually use this one to prove Banach's fixed point theorem. Um, that's a very nice statement, right? Why not? And um, many YouTube videos uh, talk about this statement. I'm not the first one, obviously. And I'm also, of course, not the first one who talks about the combinatorial parts. Actually, there's a very nice video by uh, one blue, uh, three blue, one brown, which is linked in the description. It is also about the combinatorial application or combinatorial incarnation of portion. Anyway, so this is definitely a statement in topology. That's at least what I think. And then there are various incarnations in in um, uh, in combinatorics and set theory and what I just explained, brain activities and black holes. Who knows? Um, let me just, before I go to the next slide, which would be combinatorial, the combinatorial bosch ulam theorem, which I find very easy to remember because I like combinatorics, of course. Uh, let me just mention the kind of the classical picture people would like you to keep in mind here is you should think of, well, S2 is, of course, the Earth, right? The, the surface of the Earth is S2 and some continuous varying parameters on the surface of the Earth approximately would be kind of temperature and pressure. And this is saying that there are always two antipodal points on the surface of the Earth, uh, which has the same temperature and pressure. That's, that's a, maybe a popular science version of exactly the same. Anyway, so um, the bosch ulam theorem in combinatorics is the following. So take, take B2 or Bn in general, and what you should do is you should triangulate it in a certain way. So I want to triangulate it such that I always have antipodal points in my triangulation. Um, so those, well, maybe, maybe let's do it this way, this way, and here's square, and here's antipodal one, and uh, a star, this is what's supposed to be a star, and a star. And I want this to satisfy a certain condition. I want to color this with, well, double as many uh, colors as I see, well, in my dimension. So in, in, this, in this example, I have dimension two, and I have four colors, which I, I well, well, actually I have four numbers and I identify them as colors. And I want to do this in an antipodal way. Um, so every color has a partner. Green is partner to red, and they should be always opposite to one another. What I do in the, on the inside doesn't matter. I, it's only on the outside. On the outside, I want them to be opposite to one another. And the statement is then that there exists an edge, which is this one in this case, at least one which has uh, the, the two partner colors as, as their vertices. In this case, this was a green one here and the red one here because they are partners. So those two are partners, and of course, those two are partners. So no matter what I do, no matter what I do in the middle, I would always find, um, so for example, I could color the whole thing green in the middle, and then this edge would be my, or, or this one, alternatively, would be the, the edge that appears here in the theorem. So this is kind of a little bit surprising, and it's, there is some antipodal thing going on, some coloring. So it might not be too far off to think that this is related to the other statement, but it's certainly not clear why this should be in, in any way the same. Um, to give you a hint, so here it's actually easiest to see why this should be true. I'm not going to tell you much about why the other statements should be true, the equivalent ones, but here I think it's pretty easy to see because if you think of the, um, Kind of the smallest possible if you want. So this is again B2. And my B2 is just distorted. It just looks like a square, but it doesn't really matter. I have still my antipodal points here, colored in the same way. And now I need to choose a triangulation, which would either to connect those two points, and I found my edge, or to 
connect those two points and I found my edge. So the, this the theorem, the bosch ulam theorem combinatorially is kind of an extension of this easy case of the square. So it's kind of believable that this is true. Right, so we are ready for the next one, I guess. And that's a that theoretical one, the covering version. Not quite sure, but certainly also a little bit different than, from what we have seen before. And it works as follows. So it's again about the sphere here in my example is S1. And you cover it in an open way with, uh, with a blue one, which runs around a little bit like this, because it's open, they dissect a little bit. And a red one, uh, which winds a little bit around like this. And then you have two antiphoto points contained, let's say, in the blue one. In, in this example, they're contained in the blue and in the red one. It's kind of the point is one of them has to be a little bit bigger because you have this open properties, so a little bit overlapping. And no matter what you do, in this case, you would get um, that either one of them at least contains. Uh, uh, one of those antipodal pairs. In general, you take Sn and n plus one covering, n plus one of those open sets. And if you have n plus one of those open sets, you're always guaranteed to find one of them which contains an antipodal point, which is, again, believable that it's related to the other theorems, but also quite of different in flavor. And I find this one very surprising if you think about let's say a, a hemisphere like, like the Earth and uh, two hemispheres of the Earth and then a third one kind of crazily overlapping. And I don't know, I, I find this theorem very, very surprising. Um, well, and the main theorem is actually, well, they are all equivalent and I also have written down a few more equivalent statements and they're all true. So equivalent and true, not just equivalent, but also true. Um, so I showed you the green one, which was uh, so the green one, which was the one from topology. So this one was a green one. There was a combinatorics one, the red one, and there was a covering one, the purple one. That's exactly what it is. Um, and there are some various versions of that. I call them A A prime, A A prime, capital or small, uh, which are all kind of the same flavor of statement and it's really believable that they are equivalent and that's not so hard to show and um, that they are equivalent to b and c is not completely obvious because they are really different in flavor again the point here is that you have a topological statement which has a combinatorial shadow which actually isn't really a shadow which is kind of equivalent anyway and whether you want to call this covering thing a combinatorial or a set theoretical or a topological statement I leave it to you, it's not quite clear to me anyway. Uh, the point is that this really, I say it again, that this really opened kind of a field like topological uh, combinatorics because a lot of arguments in combinatorics you can boil down to classical statements in topology. And this was one of the first examples um, where this actually happened. There's another one, which of course the Banach fixed point theorem and Sperner's lemma is, a, is the associated one. Here is Tucker's lemma. Uh, the associated combinatorial statement. It's kind of the same flavor. And so there are a lot of the theorems which have in topology, kind of classical geometric topology, if you want, that have uh, analogs in combinatorics, which I find pretty beautiful and very surprising actually. Okay, so let me finish by stating the ham sandwich theorem. I, I can't make a video about Borshuk Ulam uh, without mentioning one of the main applications whether you want to call it an application is a little bit questionable because it's, it's a statement of the same flavor anyway. So this is also very popular because, well, as you can see, you can illustrate it very nicely. So you will find zillions of, of very nice illustrations. So this one I, I, I stole from a very nice um, web page actually, you will find it in the description. And it's kind of the same thing again. It has a topological version and it has a set theoretical version. I just decided to call the topological version a covering version because it, it looks more like a covering statement. And this is kind of the classical ham sandwich theorem here that you will find in many sources and it works as follows. You have n measurable sets in Rn. So in my example here, I have R3 and I have three measurable sets, ham, cheese, and sandwich. And they lie somewhere in space. 
and I can cut them by a hyperplane, by one single hyperplane. So by one single knife cut, I can cut them such that all of them are divided into areas of the same size. So we read. So in, in this cut upstairs here, it, it actually works. And that's a bit surprising. I mean, in Rn, you have n sets crazily arranged. They're not completely crazy. They are measurable sets, but they're crazily arranged. And you will still find an hyperplane, just one, that cuts through all of them such that you really uh, dissect or bisect the, the area. Um, yeah, I, I think this is kind of more like a covering statement. It reminds us a little bit uh, about this statement. Anyway, you can also call it, you, I could also would have, could have made this green, which would make, would be the kind of the topo topological statement. And again, the point is there's a version in combinatorics, um, which I find very surprising. And I stayed here only for, uh, for uh, n equals two, basically. So it's not equivalent to the ham sandwich theorem, but it's really, really just a version of the n equals two ham sandwich theorem, if you want. And I also find that very puzzling that that actually should work. Um, but actually, anyway, here we go. It's a, it's a discrete statement, it's combinatorics. So I have a number of red points somewhere in the plane, some finite number of them arranged in any way. I have a number of blue points anywhere in the plane, anywhere, arranged in any way. And I can find my cutting hyperplane here, so this is H, that bisects both of them at once. And I really would, would like to stress that I bisect the blue points and at the same time I bisect the red points. And by that, I mean, I have four red points on this side and I have four red points on this side. And it's a discrete version of this area thing. Um, I have four blue points on this side and I have four blue points on this side. And there might be cases, and this is one of them, where I need my line to cross through a point. So this point actually lies on both sides. Okay? But if you accept that, then you have this nice theorem. And I find this very surprising. I mean, I spread randomly red points on the plane. I spread randomly blue points on the plane. I can still bisect them uh, just as the other set would be there. It's, I think this is really surprising. Anyway, let me wrap up. So um, the bosch ulap theorem is one of the first theorems that opened this field of uh, topological combinatorics, where a lot of statements in topology have some analog or are useful in applications in more discrete parts of mathematics, like discrete mathematics, what a surprise, or combinatorics or graph theory, something like that. Um, and then if you believe that these topological arguments are then useful in graph theory, then it might not be a super big step anymore to accept that they are also useful in, in real life applications like, um, like this, this brain functions that I discussed and that are linked in the description. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and I also hope to see you next time.